Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Aruna Ramesh. I head the Department of Emergency Medicine. For us, we are the frontline people who are going to be receiving patients. Currently, the government of Karnataka has divided the hospitals into COVID management hospitals and non-COVID management hospitals. But being in the front line now, we have to get ready for the surge. So we do not know when the movement is going to occur and more patients are going to be coming. But still, the government is going to continue to classify the hospitals as COVID ready or COVID accepting hospital. That means they are going to be receiving patients with COVID suspicion, suspicion and also at the same time, they're going to be continuing medical emergencies other than COVID, which has to be addressed. And these patients should not be mixed with COVID patients. So the safety of the patients is going to be a major concern. And this is going to be continuing to be addressed by the government of Karnataka. So we have to keep it simple. When we recognize a patient who is already suspected COVID, or we are screening these patients once they arrive at the hospital as a triaging facility, which is set up in front of the emergency area out of the perspective of the patient actual care. So we are going to be dividing these patients into the criteria that has already been discussed and is being followed as suspected cases of COVID and non-suspected cases. And if they are suspected, they're going to be following the criteria for going into hospitals that are COVID ready or the patients who are not COVID suspected will continue to remain at all other hospitals. So in case it is going to be a COVID suspected, now the question comes, what we need to recognize first. These patients who are coming in with fever, cough and breathlessness, we need to decide and have a simple measure of seeing where, what we need to do for these patients. So recognition of hypoxia is going to be important in these patients. A simple pulse oximeter is going to tell us if this patient requires oxygen or not. So any patients who have a saturation of less than 90% and who cannot actually make sentences or who cannot count numbers of up to five to seven is going to say that this patient is in respiratory distress. So what is advised is to put a simple face mask or what we call as a face mask with a reservoir bag where we need to give 10 to 15 liters of oxygen for these patients. And we might be achieving a FiO2, what we call as uh, the FiO2 is now, when you breathe room air, it is 21%, but with an oxygen flow of 10 to 15 liters in a non-rebreathing mask, can be achieved up to 0.9 to 0.95%. 9, 9, so th this way, we can increase the saturation of the patients. So this is what the non-rebreathing mask looks like, but it has got two valves on it. If any one of the valves fall off, it'll become a partial rebreathing mask and might not be able to achieve more than 60 to 70%. So if both the valves are working, uh, then we'll be able to achieve at least more than 90% in these patients. But remember, again, it depends on the amount of oxygen available available and when you are giving it out of a cylinder 15 liters per minute has to be calculated how long you will be giving so in such patients we are looking at a partial rebreathing mask and a non rebreathing mask again we need to keep in consideration the availability of the oxygen cylinders high flow nasal <coughs> oxygen is another way of delivering high concentration oxygen to these patients. But these nasal cannulas are currently not available as a widespread unit in most of the hospitals. So these are things that you can apply, but what is also available where you will know the exact FiO2 is Venturi devices. Most of the hospitals have these Venturi devices, but the maximum amount of FiO2 or oxygen concentration we can give using these devices is 60%. But again, what is going to be 
The best part of using Venti mask is here you can start off with a lower flow and slowly increase the oxygen, uh, what amount of oxygen you're going to be giving to try to, to have a saturation over 90%. So that way you can conserve the amount of oxygen you will be giving. So these are the various types of devices the uh, venturi uh, delivery systems that is available and on that is marked how much percentage of oxygen the patient will be getting and also what is the flow we need to set for these patients and then in case the patients cannot maintain oxygen saturation over 90 percent definitely these patients will need to be intubated and intubation is a procedure that has to be by a specialist airway team in COVID suspected patients. So when do we actually intubate the patient is when they cannot maintain the patency of the airway, when you think that there is a possibility of aspiration, when the patient is not able to ventilate in spite of oxygen delivery, we are not able to oxygenate the patient and the saturation continues to remain less than 90%, the patient is in respiratory distress in spite of all our efforts, then we need to plan intubation. But again, remember, intubation has to be done by a specialist team in COVID suspected patients. So rapid sequence intubation is what is recommended where you have an endotracheal tube with a cuff ready and using a stilet or a bougie, it has to be introduced. And to do this, we have to give an induction agent which can put the patient to sleep and use a neuromuscular relaxant again to help us to ease the intubation of the patient. So what is going to be most important here again, it should be, patient, it should be consultants who have the privileges to do the intubation and who have the expertise to be attempting intubation in such high risk patients. So the goal is not to do a bag mask ventilation as it was said, this will initiate the aerosol infection and droplet infection. So we have to straight away do what is called as a rapid sequence induction using, let us keep it simple as ketamine is available across and also using etomidate is another drug that can actually maintain the hemodynamics of these patients. And we use a muscle relaxant, succinylcholine or rocuronium with the onset of paralysis occurs within the next one minute. Remember again, this has to be done by a specialist who has privileges of doing the intubation. It is not for every healthcare workers to attempt at this point of time. So the most important thing for people who are going to be managing the airway, as Dr. Ne has already said, that you need to have a team. So you should be having it done in a negative pressure room, but not all places have negative pressure room. So you need to, alternative to that is going to be a closed room. So you need to have a strict policy where at least only three people are in the room and the rest are going to be runners out of the room. The standard ASA monitoring has to be done for these patients as an ECG, NIPP, and a pulse oximeter. N95 is the minimum mask that you need to wear. PPE is what we talk about. This is a special PPE because it is direct exposure to the aerosol infection while the person is going to be intubating patients. So gown first, hand scrub, then you wear the mask next, hand scrub, goggles next, hand scrub, and then you wear your gloves last. So this is how it is going to be followed and all the people who are going to be in their room have to be assigned jobs. The person who has the expertise is going to be the person who is going to be intubating the patient. There is going to be an assistant who is going to be assisting to give the equipment for the intubating person. And also you have a person who will be giving the drugs and monitoring the patient and trying to do the other assistance if required. So no avoid, no training should be attempting this at any point of time. So each one knowing the job will actually start and closed loop communication is indicated for these patients. What we need to avoid 
any aerosols that need to be used, no bag mask ventilation, and also the, only the expertise is going to attempt in these patients. Pre-oxygenation to at least achieve more than 95% saturation, rapid sequence induction, and always try to use the video laryngoscope whenever possible so that the distance is maintained and you will be able to visualize the cords. If not, use a bougie or a stillet in the endotracheal tube. So what we need to do is modify it according to the patient requirement, the rapid sequence induction, and if at all you need to do manual ventilation, then only small tidal volume should be used ensure high heat and moisture exchange filter is used so that the particulate matter that are going to be airborne is minimized and between the breathing circuit and the face mask and the reservoir bag. So now intubation is completed and we have checked whether the tube is in place by the auscultation method. Again, it'll require you for the person to be going close to the patient to do it. So it'll be the person who is giving the drug who will have to do the five point auscultation using the ETCO2 monitor, entitled carbon dioxide monitor, will tell us if the, if the tube is in place. And then the fixation of the tube, now comes the main and important aspect of it. The scope that has been used has to be put into a Ziploc cover zipped up and put into the decontamination tray. And after removing the protective equipment, we, we are after, for removal of the protective equipment, the entire team has to move into the uh, uh, de-donning uh, area, or they can at least remove in the same area and they should dispose the same in the bin that is allocated so that everything can be in an enclosed space and they should move out to wash their hands in safe areas. So people should avoid touching other equipment and touching the hair and the face during at any point of time while they have wearing the PPE in these patients. So it is very important as much as wearing the PPE disposable of the PPE also is equally important. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Sunil Karanth. I head the ICU at Manipal Hospital, Department of Critical Care Medicine. Uh, so I'll be largely talking on the uh, management of ARDS and respiratory failure in uh, patients with uh, any form of viral pneumonia and of course uh, with COVID when they come to us. Uh, we wish that not to see any of such patients in the ICU because we know that once they uh, need uh, admission into the ICU, you find that the mortality jumps up quite significantly. Uh, if you look at the studies, the early studies, we find that the mortality goes anywhere between 20 to 40 percent in different centers, uh, which is a fairly high mortality when somebody comes to the uh, intensive care unit uh, with ARDS, especially when we talk about COVID-19 positive patients. Uh, management of hypoxemic respiratory failure uh, can vary depending on the severity of the hypoxemia and the uh, what we call as the severity of the ARDS itself. Uh, as uh, Dr. Aruna has already mentioned, uh, following the initial triaging and initial management in the emergency department, they will be moved to the intensive care unit or to, the, to a normal ward, depending on how sick they are. Uh, a face mask with reservoir bag will give, uh, give you about 60% plus FiO2, uh, but it's a very uncontrolled oxygen. So if somebody needs um, uh, this for a very, very long time, then it's very important to analyze and see if this patient should be left on, uh, hypo on face mask reservoir bag or any other form of non-invasive sort of uh, methods of positive pressure. Uh, because one of the things that we know from data from the SARS-CoV-1 and a couple of other coronavirus-based uh, cohort studies that uh, patients on NIV and HFNO or high-flow nasal oxygen uh, did worse than those who were directly intubated. Now, th uh, there are two reasons. Possibly one is because the intervention of intubation gets delayed. And second, of course, you're also exposing your uh, health staff, health care workers to a, a greater risk if the intubation has to be done in a hurry. So if to put these patients on high flow nasal cannula or an NIV, you need to balance the risk of uh, how quickly the patient may deteriorate 
right? Or uh, when you have to intubate these patients, and as Dr. Aruna has already mentioned, it is preferable to do uh, elective or semi-elective intubations in these patients than in a uh, sort of a crash kind of a situation. Uh, so HFNO, NIV is used, but it has to the pros and cons of the same have to be analyzed and have to be really debated before being used in, uh, in these patients who come with hypoxic respiratory failure. So these are the different kinds of rebreathing masks which has already been uh, shown. Now coming to specific management of uh, uh, the ARDS patients uh, due to any form of viral pneumonitis, specifically with COVID, uh, it's not any different to any other ARDS. Uh, as you know, there is a specific definition for ARDS, the Berlin's criteria, based on which we classify it as mild, moderate, severe. Uh, the crux of management of ARDS is what we call as low tidal volume ventilation, high frequency, and moderate PEEP. Now, this is because, uh, uh, as you know, ARDS itself is an inflammatory reaction to a particular insult, either in the lung or outside the lung, wherein extensive uh, exudation happens and you find that the about two-thirds of the lungs, predominantly the lower posterior part of the lung is filled up with exudative fluid. So about one-third of the remaining normal lung uh, will have to be ventilated with low, low tidal volume, and that is the principle on how we ventilate most of our patients with ARDS. Uh, so you start with about 6 ml per kg, measuring what we call as the plateau pressure, which gives you an indirect estimate of the compliance of the system. When I say system, it gives you the uh, uh, estimate of the compliance of the uh, lung predominantly and, of course, uh, to some extent, the chest wall as well. Uh, so you start with 6 and uh, you may have to reduce the tidal volume to, um, to, up to about 4 ml per kg in case the plateau pressure goes above. 20, above 25 or 30 centimeters of water. Uh, so that's going to be the crux in how you are, uh, that's going to be the uh, principle on how you are going to decide your uh, tidal volume. So it will be about 4 to 6 ml per kg, like in any other ARDS uh, ventilation. So what mode of ventilation you use, it could be control or uh, pressure, but control is preferable because you have a measure of the extent of uh, volume that's going in. And uh, most studies with ARDS or big randomized trials have been used have been done using volume controlled ventilation. So it's going to be volume controlled, four to six ml per kg, targeting a plateau pressure of less than 30 and uh, uh, aiming to achieve a, a normal uh, CO2. But in case you find that the respiratory rate needs to be going above 30 or 35 and you're, uh, you're actually driving your uh, minute ventilations to dangerous levels uh, by causing the risk of increased ventilator induced lung injury, then it may be appropriate to uh, accept a certain amount of elevation of the CO2 what we call today in critical care uh, language as permissive hypercapnia. So it's okay to accept a CO2 of 40 to 60 or even a little higher as long as the pH remains above 7.2. So today the carbon dioxide clearance in somebody who is having severe ARDS is largely based on aiming for the pH of above 7.2 and uh, not overdoing the uh, correction of the CO2. So this is how the ventilation uh, uh, respiratory rate and uh, tidal volume and or in general the minute ventilation is going to be set. Uh, in terms of PEEP, obviously hypoxemic respiratory fa uh, failure patients would need a slightly higher PEEP to maintain their oxygenation. Why they need higher PEEP is to ensure opening of the collapsed alveoli and to keep them open, what we call as uh, open lung strategy. Uh, so these are some of the things which we normally conventionally use for any patient with ARDS, and it can be used in patients with uh, COVID-based uh, pneumonitis or COVID-based ARDS as well. Uh, proning is very, very useful. In fact, the unpublished data from Europe seems to show that these patients respond much better to proning than the previous uh, coronavirus uh, uh, patients like the MERS or the uh, SARS-CoV-1 uh, patients. So therefore, that's uh, some sort of a blessing in disguise that they seem to respond a little better to proning. But that's something that we need to be employing early in these patients if you find that hypoxemia or hypercapnia is not being able to be corrected. Uh, and it's, and uh, today, we also know from critical care literature, from already documented literature, that uh, proning is beneficial, especially in patients with severe uh, ARDS, where the FPO to FIO2 ratio is less than, 10, uh, less than 100. So prone these patients early if you have to. And uh, uh, for that, of course, all the relevant uh, precautions need to be taken. Uh, so it's better to prone these patients electively than actually doing a, a crash proning. And when you prone them, keep them prone for about 16 to 20 hours and only then sort of supine them. Uh, the other principles of management of hypoxemic respiratory failure remain. Most importantly, uh, things like uh, fluid uh, restriction, especially in the first 
three to five days. There is good data to say that restriction of fluid in ARDS reduces ventilatory days, early weaning, may not change mortality, but definitely seems to help the lung to improve its oxygenation faster. This, of course, needs to be balanced against the risk of having uh, tissue hypoperfusion. So in somebody with severe shock, you may not be able to do this strategy, but that's something otherwise you may employ in patients with no shock. Neuromuscular blocking agents is yet another maneuver which has seemed to be showing benefit, and this is again data from uh, other ARDS patients. Uh, getting into more uh, complex extreme forms of ARDS, uh, extracorporeal life support or ECMO as we would say, data for this is very, very limited. So it's not something that is straight away advisable in the current uh, scenario. It's important to ensure that all your patients who are having COVID and are intubated have what is called as uh, inline suction devices so that you don't have to break the circuit for uh, suctioning. Uh, especially in COVID, it's needed because you want to protect your healthcare workers from the aerosol spray. And of course, in patients with ARDS, we don't want to break the circuit whenever they are being ventilated with very high levels of uh, degrees of ventilation or very, with very high ventilating pressures. Patients may present to the ICU or present to the uh, medical facility with shock, either due to the primary illness, which could be COVID or any other form of pneumonia, or they may develop septic shock as they are uh, uh, when they are in the hospital or in the ICU for a prolonged period of time or what we call a secondary sepsis is possible. So management of septic shock would be like uh, on uh, lines with any other uh, septic shock patient. Fluid resuscitation, commence vasopressors, ma make sure the MAP is above 60 or 65. Early appropriate antibiotics if you're not sure that this is a COVID patient. And when we talk about um, targets, you will be looking at a map of about 60, urine output about 0.5 ml uh, per, k, uh, per kg per hour, uh, and uh, hoping to have a capillary refill of uh, less than two seconds and make sure that there is a response to resuscitation by a decreasing lactate in the first hour. Uh, so the other uh, principles of management of septic shock include resuscitation of fluid, etc. would remain the... Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope all of you can hear me. If you can hear, can you please wave your hand? This is Dr. Sri Ram. I am a consultant to critical care medicine in Manipal Hospital. So I'll be speaking about uh, troubleshooting ventilators. Uh, so uh, it's about mechanical ventilation in COVID-19 setting, how we are going to encounter problems and how, how we are going to troubleshoot them. So essentially in intensive care, there are multiple areas in which we may have to do troubleshooting, uh, starting from admission, what are the criteria, isolation practices, staffing, especially with anxiety, fear or willingness to uh, you know take care of these patients personal protective equipments, um, uh, adequacy, as well as, you know, rationing of these things, testing, and uh, um, if the uh, pandemic becomes big, then there can be many ethical aspects with, uh, with respect to uh, how we are going to treat uh, patients who are very elderly. But basically, today I'll stick to ventilator troubleshooting. Um, troubleshooting may be required at multiple areas, um, hypotension in a ventilated patient, high airway pressure alarms, dyssynchrony between uh, uh, ventilator and the patient, and also desaturation. Uh, first thing is to look at the patient. So um, uh, before we embark on doing any, uh, any intervention, we need to essentially look at the patient. Is the chest moving? What is the saturation? And how are the hemodynamics? I think these are the things which will tell the urgency of the problem. So now next thing is to uh, see whether the problem is urgent and if the problem is urgent, is it a patient problem or it is an equipment problem? Now, um, so this diagram depicts the same. Is it a man problem or a machine problem? So uh, what we need to know is all ventilators are not the same. We need to know our ventilators. You are all doctors from different part of the state. So um, all ventilators cannot be uh, made by the same manufacturer. We all have to understand our ventilators before putting a patient on the ventilator. Um, now, first thing I would like to speak about uh, hypotension. So it can be because of hypovolemia, because once the pressure inside the thorax increases with positive pressure ventilation, venous return comes down. And especially in a patient who is hypovolemic, there can be drop in BP. Um, there may be drugs that are used to treat the patient, um, which can cause vasodilatation, for example, anesthetic medications, propofol. Or else, the, there can be myocardial depression. COVID-19 um, can have myocardial involvement also, approximately 10% patients. So we should be wary of myocardial depression. Uh, there can be dynamic hyperinflation. I'll show what it is in the next slide. So uh, this is how the pressure as well as uh, volume curve looks like. 
what we can see here if you look at the lower half of the diagram the, there is a gradual accumulation in volume the baseline is actually going up so that means um, there is bronchoconstriction or extremely high respiratory rate insufficient time for exhalation to take place that leads to air trapping and there will be low bp so dynamic hyperinflation is something that we need to understand because many times we end up ventilating these patients at a very high respiratory rate as per ards protocol um, what dr sunil had discussed before um, hypotension can be because of uh, tension pneumothorax these are patients who have um, lung compliance which is not normal it is reduced so they can develop tension pneumothorax secondary to volume or pressure induced trauma high airway pressure this is another trouble that we may encounter in patients who are being ventilated um, which can cause barotrauma and it it can also cause inadequacy of ventilation so this is how it looks um, the uh, pressure curve which is in yellow if you can see first two um, uh, curves are representing the normal pressure curve Uh, and once the pressure increases you can see the abrupt cut off and uh, if you look at the volume curve that is on the lower half of the diagram the adequacy of volume that is delivered has come down so it can cause inadequate ventilation so we need to rectify this problem as soon as possible so uh, this is a simple um, um, uh, physics which tells how the pressure can go up pressure can be increased by increased flow or increased resistance or else there is a real lung problem as de depicted in the circle um the compliance uh, how compliant the lung is that could have been reduced because of the disease that is covid 19 now inappropriate settings if you set excessive tidal volume which are not in line with the ards network uh, strategy or else if the expiratory time inspiratory time is too short that is if you have to deliver the tidal volume in a very short interval of time then there can be elevation in airway pressure so it can be a resistance problem or a compliance problem the upper arrow uh, reflects the resistance problem uh, so you can see that it can be because of endotracheal tube which is blocked or kinked or else it can be a, um, can be bronchospasm or it can be a compliance problem where in uh, lung parenchyma itself is very stiff in uh, like in most of the cases of pneumonia or there can be chest wall problem or else there can be decrease in lung volume because of external compression like a pneumothorax so this is what you can see here Uh, so uh, here this diagram shows uh, pneumothorax which can again cause high airway pressure alarm um, so these points have to be kept in mind this this slide shows endobronchial intubation left side of the uh, left lung is collapsed whereas right lung is hyperinflated uh, next is how the pressure curve looks so if you see something like this there can be a uh, you know um, inspiratory pause pressure which is slightly lower than the peak pressure this is how it should look so if you see that these curves are not matching up with what you see in the patient you should suspect either a machine or the patient there is a problem you need to troubleshoot dyssynchrony is another uh, issue so dyssynchrony can be because of agitation patient is extremely agitated then you have to look for the cause and treat it patient may be anxious he may be having pain or is the mode or the tidal volume is, is not fitting the patient his requirements then you have to sort out that problem um inspiratory and expiratory ratio could have been uh, uh, not optimal so that option that has to be sorted triggering sometimes uh, accidentally somebody must have kept a very high flow or pressure trigger that also needs to be looked into um if the dyssynchrony is uh, uh, not being managed even with adjustment of ventilator mode or ie ratio then you will have to consider sedation and the other issue can be desaturation wherein you have set a, um, a particular fio2 but with that the patient is not able to maintain oxygen saturation immediately you make the fio2 one give the patient 100% oxygen next thing that you have to look at is is the chest moving so if the chest is not moving uh, then you will have to manually ventilate the patient now especially in covid 19 at this step it is very important to take adequate precaution if you have to disconnect a patient from ventilation immediately you should be wearing appropriate ppe and you should be stopping the ventilator before you start bagging the patient only after you do that you manually ventilate the patient see whether it is easy to ventilate or not if it is not easy to ventilate then it could be endotracheal tube re related problem or a patient problem if you are able to ventilate well with an ambu bag then it is a ventilator problem so this is how you decide whether it is a ventilator problem or a patient and et tube related problem and then you treat the cause so if the chest is moving well then you have to examine the patient again in particular look for endobronchial intubation so the chest is moving 
so you will have to think about uh, you know one of the lung being not ventilated and the other lung is being ventilated that's why patient is resaturating or else that could be pneumothorax or pulmonary edema or spasm so you have to treat the cause i think goals of ventilation has already been covered by dr sunil we have also seen prone ventilation is an option but here again trouble will be the manpower and the pp that is required so all caution has to be taken and uh, key points at the end of uh, my talk is always look at the patient first try to distinguish between a ventilator problem and an equipment problem have an algorithm for dealing with common problems uh, because it's a pandemic kind of situation we have to concentrate on simple issues thank you hello everybody i hope uh, your attention is still on and uh, this has been quite exhaustive i am uh, dr satyanarayana mysore head of pulmonology manipal most of the things have been covered so i will only touch upon key points in my slide set hypoxia consciousness blood pressure age comorbidities and may or may not be available radiological features this will help in triaging the patients as mild moderate and severe so supportive therapy is quite important it is important because it may help in uh, arresting the progression of the disease having said that progression of the disease is dependent upon the viral factor the virulence the humoral immunity um, cell mediated immunity host factors so any tachypnea desaturations age uh, coexisting diseases which i have highlighted so these are very important so what do we do what supportive therapy is really important in a mild case current government, government guideline is people with mild disease still it is um at a decent number better to keep in the hospital ensure that they are uh, you know uh, smear negative uh, viral uh, sampling is negative and um, they may not require much more than anti tc so that uh, inominate uh, surfaces are not contaminated secondly they will require anti pyretics and they will require um, anti tussives so um most often the dictum is less contact with the patient and uh, as much as possible remote monitoring every entry into the patient's room has to be calculated and minimize contact um second management of the hospitalized patients in this the aim is target saturation to be maintained is more than 94% any talk about niv whether it is an apap or a cpap or a avap or a bipap bi level ventilation be very very clear that this will lead to aerolizing uh, aerolization and the threat of aerolization is very high make sure that the blood culture is sent and a prophylactic antibiotic is given at the beginning while choosing the antibiotic be aware of uh, uh qt interval that can be brought about if you plan to give put the patient on um, chloroquine do not give azithromycin rather select something else much more like doxycycline simple thing is at admission if by chance an ecg has been done look for the qt interval and uh, if it is less than half of the preceding rr interval it could be very safe to give chloroquine if you are intent on that current icmr evidence is to treat with chloroquine which we'll come to simple measures do matter in mild and moderate disease head and elevation there is some upcoming data on uh, use of uh, uh, povidine uh, betadine mouth gargles um, adequate glycemic control uh, ppi could be used most importantly prevent vte and um, pe uh to reduce the contact with uh, multiple entries into the patient's room a foley's catheter plus or minus rails tube if the oral intake is not good these things need to be considered at the outset itself advisable to have a central venous catheter and posture change it may be advisable to have uh, a posture change uh, group which may look at uh, you know proning patients um in uh, not ventilated patients they may actually get into the uh, dirty area to change patient position the this particular slide has been well covered by dr aruna ramesh
so goal is to maintain uh, uh, saturation more than 90 to 94 percent a bit higher in pregnant women and in children if there is any of the following things obstructed breathing absent breath sounds central sinuses uh, convulsions um, you know uh, resuscitation with the target saturation more than 94 percent and the most important thing we all know the mechanisms of uh, ARDS given that in sari related covid 19 patients the propensity to ARDS is slightly more based on this be very very cautious about how you hydrate patients antimicrobial if it is a um, moderate to severe or critical patient um, look at your uh, local antibiograms what are the local sensitivity prevailing and choose the antibiotic wisely um, there is um, now the all india institute protocol which is more or less the icmr protocol and uh, it is important to give um, the neuramidase inhibitor at 150 milligram twice a day avoid steroids unless the patient really needs it if it is a patient with tertiary hypoadrenalism if the patient has bronchial asthma and has to have steroid there is no question of not giving steroid but do not give steroid if there is no firm indication delayed viral clearance um, you know glucose intolerance these are some of the things and more importantly, psychosis, steroid psychosis. These could be challenging things. Now, um, one of the cornerstone is to recognize who is heading towards a progressive respiratory failure, who is in sepsis, and adequately institute measures. Communication. See, most often in a SARI unit, you do not let uh, visitors and family. Therefore, uh, there has to be empathy adequate communication with the family time to time and um, you know prognostic information needs to be conveyed to them on a daily basis for medications like chloroquine uh, ART like lopinavir with retinovir um, or using plasma convalescent plasma exchange please do make sure you take a special consent chloroquine is kind of gained its prominence in this uh, COVID-19 era. It works basically by very simple method. It is a weak base and it will um, let the lysosomal membranes develop a basic ionic change which will make the viral particles hard to enter. It may also interfere with the ACE2 glycation and the mitogen uh, activated um, protein kinases receptor block and thereby replication of the virus may be uh, late or delayed these are some of the mechanisms that have been postulated the evidence is uh, not very concrete the French trial um, has its own limitations uh, it was not a randomized control trial there were many dropouts and the cause for dropout were not uh, you know very clear and 15 out of the 20 six patients uh, out of them three one went into icu one refused chloroquine so it's not very clear but the french government has officially kind of elected to go with chloroquine the second uh, run of data from wuhan is coming out which is against chloroquine so watch this space it is a dynamic uh, thing till then icmr recommendation is to use chloroquine if there are no contraindications i will skip the prophylactic dosage but a word of caution prophylaxis is not for everyone it should be reserved for close contact of proven patients secondly for healthcare professionals working in a sari unit nsaid is a hot topic better not to use it how do they harm they will uh, kind of uh, drive the uh, leukotriene pathway block it and the uh, prostaglandin will be unhampered uh, production of that and that may cause uh, impairment of the local innate immunity there is lot of uh, interest in uh, arb and ace inhibitors very simple to understand this you give ace or arb you are blocking the ace receptors by blocking the ace receptor there is theoretical possibility that uh, there is increased expression of ace 2 receptor subset 
and uh, that is a portal for viral entry having said that six societies including nephrology societies cardiology societies hypertension societies have all uniquely come in favor of not changing as or arbs at this point of time remember that this is only a hypothesis the evidence may change and uh, that would be uh, 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 a time to watch for but at this point of time do not change um, if especially patients diabetics and other patients may require this however if there is significant volume depletion if the if there is going to be afferent vasoconstriction in those conditions or desperate rising creatinines you could hold as or arb for that purpose not because of the hypothesis that uh, it could lead to what we call as dales vasomotor reversal i think i have explained this slide and i'll uh, skip to the ert please make sure that all side effects are listed on a special consent form these are protease inhibitors retinovir will only boost the dosage of the lopinavir number of side effects but when should you try you should try when the it is severe see the the illness severity is more or it is a critical patient or maybe at the time when you have to you know prone a patient and there are lot of exclusions hepatic impairment or a impended drug interactions and um, supportive therapy also includes watchful uh, eye on the renal function and uh, there is no need for me to elaborate decreasing urine output any signs of uh, severe metabolic acidosis or you know refractory hyperkalemia volume overload uh, dialysis needs to be considered thank you good afternoon everyone i am dr shiv prasad senior consultant from naran rutela bangalore so today i will be i am the last speaker of the day so i'll be dealing with the complications of uh, of the patient being in icu as you all know as the patient spends a lot of time in the icu so the patient will be having a lot of uh, tubes and pipes and because of which the patient can develop complications related to the tubes and pipes namely like that if the patient has developed is on uh, endotracheal tube for a long time the patient can develop the ventilator associated pneumonia and if the patient has got a catheter that is central venous catheter or a dialysis catheter the patient can develop the catheter related bloodstream infection and because of the foley catheter long term foley catheter the patient can develop the cardi that is catheter associated urinary tract infection and also the because of the patient is been immobilized or been lying down on the same position the patient can develop stress ulcers or a bed sores and also patient can develop we have icu aquatic weakness because of the lot of drugs to start with so one of the most commonest complication or a long term complication of a uh, uh, long term uh, ventilation is the ventilator associated pneumonia so to define with there is a lot of a uh, lot of uh, term terminologies are of lately being used so ventilator associated pneumonia is a type of uh, hospital acquired pneumonia that develops within more than 48 to 72 hours after endotracheal intubation and similarly other names like hospital acquired uh, pneumonia like if the patient uh, is in the hospital for uh, longer longer than more than 48 hours and uh, and of course any patient is not uh, uh, incubating at the time of admission and there is uh, one more term called as health care associated pneumonia wherein uh, the pneumonia that occurs in a non hospital patient but the patient is been uh, in contact with the health care especially if the patient is been coming for the hospital for a wound debridement or if the patient is receiving chemotherapy or the patient is uh, residing in the hospital for uh, what are uh, many comorbidities or if the patient is on uh, attending the hemodialysis clinic so uh, why hospital acquired pneumonia is important uh, because there there is there is one of the most common cause of uh, uh, developing the infection and of course the morbidity and mortality so uh, there is something called as early onset uh, ventilator associated pneumonia and uh, late onset uh, uh, ventilator associated pneumonia the early onset uh, uh, ventilator associated pneumonia is uh, uh, which develops within less than 4 uh, days and late onset which develops after 4 days why it is important is the early onset uh, early onset uh, wap has got uh, a better prognosis and the organisms are much uh, sensitive and the antibiotics to be used are much uh, lesser uh, grade of antibiotics than those patients who are on a developed late onset 
this all. So coming to what are the risk factors, especially elderly people who are more than 70 years, severe illness, having underlying lung, and lung disease like COPD, interstitial lung disease, or if the patient has got a depressed mental status, or immunocompromising conditions like HIV, or if the patient is on any immunomodulated drugs, or if the patient has got a viral respiratory tract infection, or if the patient are on uh, chemotherapy, if the patient is on H2 blockers, or if the patient has been previously exposed to antibiotics or paralytic agent. So these are all the patients who are at risk of ventilator associated infection. So uh, this happens because of the colonization and because of the inter inter intensive care settings, use of antimicrobial agents and contaminated hands and contaminated equipment because of which patient can develop VAP. So the factors that facilitate the reflex and aspiration to the lower respiratory tract is uh, uh, especially like a patient on long-term mechanical ventilation, if the patient is on a tracheostomy, if the patient is on nasogastric tube, or if the patient is on supine position, these patients have tendency to aspirate and can develop the ventilator-associated pneumonia. And whether VAP is preventable, yes, uh, VAP is definitely preventable by uh, because you need to take a lot of precautions prior to intubation, during intubation, after intubation, and you need to follow the VAP care bundles. And also you have to have some general prophylaxis and of course the staff education. So avoid unplanned extubation and uh, reintubation. And non-invasive ventilation has been associated with a better outcome, favorable outcome. Not all patients who are in respiratory distress have to be intubated and ventilated. And of course you have to clean the respiratory equipment and devices before sterilization and uh, disinfection. Clean shortly after use and then ensure there is appropriate rinsing, drying and packaging. Use standard precautions, hand hygiene as I told you, wear gloves with uh, handling the respiratory secretions, change gloves and perform the hygiene between the patient and after touching the contaminated equipment. So there are something called as a modifiable risk factors wherein you can prevent the aspiration of secretions, you can reduce the duration of ventilation, you can reduce the colonization of the airway and digestive tract and also prevent the exposure to the contaminated equipment. So coming to how, to how you can prevent the aspiration of secretions like uh, head and elevation up to 30 to 45 degree, avoid gastric uh, over distension, avoid unplanned extubation and reintubation, use cuffed endotracheal tube with subclotic suctioning, and encourage early mobilization of patients with physical and occupational therapist. And to reduce the duration of ventilation, always try to conduct sedation vacation, assess the readiness whether the patient can be weaned from the ventilator daily, and also con uh, conduct spontaneous breathing trial. Of course, sometimes it may not be feasible on a long-term ventilated patient. So this is something about the VAP bundle wherein you have to maintain the head end elevation of 30 to 45 degrees, avoid gastric distension as I had already told, encourage early mobilization, sedation vacation, readiness to wean, used, uh, use a cuffed endotracheal tube with inline sectioning as uh, previously told by other consultants, and also avoid acid suppressive therapy if possible, and perform oral care, perform hand hygiene and prevent exposure of contaminated equipment. And whenever, especially if the patient is an elderly patient and if the patient has got a structural lung disease, always suspect Legionnaire's infection also. And coming to how to manage, uh, how will you treat the ventilator um, before choosing the right antibiotic, you have to keep in mind following the issues like what are the risk factors of the patient, was it really early, was it early or late onset uh, or and also virulence of the organisms of course antibiotic resistance and also the cost. So treatment uh, protocol includes uh, initially you have to start with empirical treatment. Start when uh, ventilator associated pneumonia is suspected, please do not delay. And individualize to institution as uh, different hospitals and different ICUs as it got uh, different organisms. So try to know the hospital uh, epidemiological data and also you have to think about the drug cost and also the availability. So individualize, individualize to the patient related to whether the patient has got early onset VAP or late onset VAP. Prior antibiotics always consider uh, drug dose modification based on the underlying liver or kidney problem. And also have no try to know the surveillance culture. And commonest pathogens what we encounter in the ICU are uh, Staphylococcus aureus, 24.7%. Of course, in India, it is more of a gram-negative organisms compared to gram-negative organisms like Klebsiella, Enterobacteria, and uh, Asnobacter. And some uh, specific uh, antimicrobial consideration, especially if the patient, when you are thinking about MRSA, always try to treat with linzolid or vancomycin is necessary. It's a first drug of choice for anti coverage. And uh, should be dis and it should be discontinued once the MRSA is not isolated. And other drug like uh, linzolate, 600 milligrams twice daily, either IV or oral, when the patient is able to receive oral medication. And consider vancomycin, 15 to 20 milligram per kg, 
every eight to twelve hours, or uh, uh, with the five patient with the normal uh, renal function and specific uh, antimicrobial consideration like uh, MRSC, like other alternative drugs like uh, telemedicine and daptomycin, septrilone and tizicycline can be considered. So coming to a specific antimicrobial consideration for gram-negative organisms, again, think about whether you have to treat with a monotherapy or a combination therapy. Try to avoid cephalosporins as a monotherapy in ICU settings. Other drugs like carbapenems uh, are the most reliable agent like meropenem, imipenem and uh, celestatin can be considered. So whenever you are considering Legionella, always uh, try to treat with the azithromycin or uh, fluoroquinolones. So again, there is a lot of debate or topic about the aerolyzed antibiotics. Yes, we can use aerolyzed antibiotics like cholestine, polymyxin, and uh, aminoglycosides can be considered as a potential antibiotics in patients with uh, multidrug resistant uh, gram-negative infections. Aerolization may increase the antibiotic concentration at the site of infection and may be particularly useful for the treatment of organism with which has got a high MICs to systemic antimicrobial agents. So other most commonest uh, 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 complication when the, during the stay in the ICU is venous thromboembolism. As you all know, venous thromboembolism is a condition in which uh, the blood clot forms in the vein, which in some cases it breaks free and then enters into the circulation as an embolus, finally lodging in completely obstructing the blood vessels, that is a deep vein thrombosis, or uh, this can obstruct the pulmonary artery and then can cause pulmonary embolism. So the most commonest cause of uh, type of venous thromboembolism is DVT, as I told you. And then death from the DVT as associated, uh, associated pulmonary embolism is about uh, 3 lakh annually in uh, America. The goal is early recognition and appropriate treatment of uh, different thrombosis and complication can, cause, can save a lot of lives. So the goals of knowledge about having the administering the pharmacotherapy for DVT are to reduce the morbidity, prevent post-thrombotic syndrome, and prevent deadly pulmonary embolism. So the commonest symptoms being the swelling in your foot, uh, leg, or ankle. There, there may be cramping pain. The patient can have unexplained pain in, the, in their foot. And also there may be area that feels warmer, than like a thrombophlebitis. And also skin or, skin or the affected area can turn pale or reddish. So again, there is some risk factors for pulmonary embolism or defined thrombosis, especially if the patient is elderly people patient being immobilized for more than three, day, three days and other uh, comorbid conditions like uh, if the patient has undergone surgery like orthopedic surgery, if the patient has got a pregnancy and postpartum period and also the malignancy and uh, if the patient has got a, uh, if, the, if the patient has traveled for uh, in a car or a flight for more than four hours. So coming to the, what are the other risk factors like thrombocytosis, there are maybe inherited uh, coagulation disorders, antithrombin-3, deficiency, anti-protein C, protein uh, S deficiency, factor V Leiden, and then oral contraceptives. And of course, if the patient is on heparin, can develop uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and can develop DVT. So based on the risk factors, that it, has been uh, it has been categorized as low risk factors and then uh, low risk, moderate risk and high risk. Low risk patients who are, who are all young patients who have got uh, no risk factors like uh, for v VTE, they don't need any prophylaxis. However, the patients with moderate risk at least one risk factor, the pharmacological the prophylaxis is required. And then high risk patients with multiple risk factors, of course, they need the pharmacological prophylaxis for uh, the DVT or pulmonary embolism. So what are the medications which has been used like low molecular heparin, unfractionated heparin, and fondoparin X. And low molecular heparin is preferred over unfractionated heparin because of the ease of administration, that is once daily or two to three times per day. Uh, and then there is a decrease uh, incidence of DVT. Unfractionated heparin is used in patients with low GFR and other mechanical methods used in patients with moderate to high risk, uh, especially if the patient has got a high risk of bleeding. And duration of DVT prophylaxis is typically for days or until the patient can ambulate and discharge of the patient, discharge from the hospital. And the prolonged duration of prophylaxis even after the discharge from the hospital is not typically recommended. So the pharmacological agent, like as I mentioned, you heparin or uh, heparin, like enoxaparin, we can give 40 milligrams subcutaneously once daily, or daltiparin 5,000 units uh, subcutaneously once a day. Unfractionated heparin, you can use 5,000 units uh, subcutaneously for every eight to uh, 12 hours. Fondoparin next, you can use 2.5 milligram subcutaneously daily. And other, of course, other oral and other uh, newer anticoagulants like rivaroxaban or metroxaban can be used. And of course, for long-term uh, uh, management of DVT and uh, pulmonary embolism, you, you can also use warfarin. 
and other mechanical agents what you can use to prevent this uh, uh, DVT like intermi intermittent pneumatic compression devices, the graduated compression stockings and venous foot pumps can be used. And of course the clinical significance means increased risk of pulmonary embolism by 50%, use DVT prophylaxis in hospitalized patients decrease the risk anywhere between 10 to 20%. And prophylaxis, DVT prophylaxis in both hospitalized medical and surgical patients. Uh, however, the mortality benefits have been reported in surgical patients, not in medical patients. So other uh, uh, complications like uh, catheter-related bloodstream infection because of the catheter, uh, central, central venous catheter or dialysis catheter. Again, there is something called as a central uh, uh, clapsy, which is defined as a laboratory confirmed bloodstream infection, not related to an infection any other sites within 48 hours of central vein placement. Of all healthcare associated infection, CLAPSI are the most uh, costly according to the almost $46,000 per case. Most cases can be preventable. And again, pathogens associated with the, are gram positive and gram negative organisms and candida. And incidence is about 4. Uh, per 4.1 per thousand case of central venous days and it can be prevented. Yes, it can be uh, recent data reveal no difference in the infection rate based on the insertion catheter site. As previously, they used to say that try to avoid the groin. I mean, most preferred site is infra uh, sub, uh, sub, uh, subclavicular, then the uh, jugular, then the uh, femoral. However, there is no uh, proper data. And of course, you need to have a hand hygiene, use 2% uh, chlorex in skin preparation, disinfecting the skin before insertion. And always try to use the ultrasound guided as you can prevent multiple puncture and multiple attempts and also try to avoid femoral line as much as possible. And prevention is disinfect the, disinfect the catheter hubs, injection ports and other connection before accessing the line. Replace the administration sets other than sets for uh, use it for uh, lipids or other blood products for 96 hours and assess the need for central line daily. Again, we have to maintain the adequate uh, overall. We have to maintain the patient on a glycemic, uh, in glycemic control, minimize the use of corticosteroid as this can cause uh, ICU acquired weakness, and also consider uh, physiotherapy and early mobilization, minimize sedation, and then uh, try to uh, correct the electrolytes, optimize the nutrition, and try to see that you try to wean them in from the ventilation. Thank you.